Well, hi. Today is Monday, uh, the 24th of May, and it is the Monday after the day of Pentecost. And so we continue to pray for the Holy Spirit to revive and invigorate the church and for the Holy Spirit to touch the lives of those who do not know Jesus and to use us to spread the gospel by preaching by word and deed that Jesus is the Lord, the Christ, and that he came to save all people who would turn to him. Our opening sentence is from Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, We will go into the house of the Lord. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us, spare all those who confess their faults, restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. O be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. O go your way, and go, your, <laughs> o go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O oh, come, let us adore him. Our psalms today begins with Psalm 136. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is gracious, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, excuse me, O oh, give thanks unto the God of all gods, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord of all lords, for his mercy endures forever. Who alone does great works, for his mercy endures forever. Who by his excellent wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. Who laid out the earth upon the waters, for his mercy endures forever. Who made the great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule the day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the light, govern the night, for his mercy endures forever. Who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his mercy endures forever. Who brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever who divided the Red Sea in two parts, for his mercy endures forever, who made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But as for Pharaoh and his host, he withdrew them, he overthrew them in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever, who led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endures forever who smote great kings, for his mercy endures forever, 
and slew mighty kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, the king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. And gave away their land for an inheritance, for his mercy endures forever. Even for an inheritance for Israel his servant, for his mercy endures forever. Who remembered us when we were in trouble, for his mercy endures forever. And delivered us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks unto the, unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 137 By the waters of Babylon we sat down and wept, when we remembered you, O Zion. As for our harps, we hung them up upon the trees that are therein. For those who led us away captive required, us, required of us a song and melody in our heaviness. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in the land of our captivity? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my dearest joy, remember the children of Edom, O, God, o Lord, in the day of Jerusalem. How they said, Down with it, down with it, even to the ground. O daughter of Babylon, wasted with misery, happy shall be the one who rewards you as you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your children and throws them against the stones. Psalm 138 I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Even before the gods will I sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your loving kindness and truth. For you have magnified your name and your word above all things. When I called upon you, you heard me and gave me increase of strength. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, and great is the glory of the Lord. For though, for though the Lord be high, yet he has respect for the lowly. As for the proud, he beholds them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, yet shall you refresh me. You shall stretch forth your hand upon the fierceness of my enemies, and your right hand shall save me. The Lord shall make good his loving kindness toward me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Despise not the works of your own hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is taken from the 25th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses continues to reveal God's laws uh, to his people, to mold them and shape them into a holy nation, a holy people of God. Is there a dispute between men? If there is a dispute between men and they come into court and the judge decides between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty, then if the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes in proportion to his offense. Forty stripes may be given him, but not more, lest, if one should go on to beat him with more stripes than these, your brother be degraded in your sight. 
you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out grain. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to the gate to the elders and say, My bro husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him, and if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. When men fight with one another, and the wife of the one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of him who is beating him, and puts out her own hand and seizes him by the private parts, then you shall cut off her hand. Your eye shall not have, shall your eye shall have no pity. You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, a large and a small. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are all an abomination to the Lord your God. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary, and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation, and on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy. For the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our second lesson is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 12, verse 54, through chapter 13, verse 9. Jesus also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, There will be a scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites! You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. 
There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen, on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O King of all the ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One of Israel. For you only are the Holy One. All nations were draw near and fall down before you, because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please join with me as we ask the Holy Spirit to come now into our hearts, into our minds, and fill us with the presence of God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come, and fill us now. In our minds, in our souls and bodies, fill us with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, Quicken in us a passion for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and a compassion for those in this world who are lost and lonely and hungry and suffering. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves and hope, help us to remember that through the parable of the Good Samaritan. Our neighbors are anyone whom you place before us, even our enemies. Amen. Today's lessons can be, again, if we look at the um, Psalter and we look at the first lesson, can, again, be a bit challenging for us. Uh, the first uh, psalm is, has the repetitive theme all through it, for his mercy endures forever. Indeed, it does. And we do need that repetition in our life because, you know, we hear uh, God speaking through Moses to the Israelites, you are a stubborn people. And the reality is that's a, that's a statement about all of humanity. All of us are stubborn. All of us need the repetition and the reminders and and so we need to remember that God's mercy endures forever. And I think that's especially helpful when we look at some of these harder sayings in the Bible. Look at Psalm 30, excuse me, 137, the very last verse, verse 9, is one of the most troublesome and challenging for me in all of the scriptures. Blessed shall he be who takes your children and throws them against the stones. That's, that's, 
we say sometimes that's cold. To read in context, which is always important, we need to look at this entire psalm as a psalm of the Israelites in captivity and the mocking. Oh, you who we've captured, you who we've, dra we've drugged here to Babylon, sing us one of those happy songs of Zion, will you? We'd like to hear one of those right now. There's a cruelty in that. There's a mocking. And then verse 8 directly impacts the psalmist pain and response in verse 9. O oh, daughter of Babylon, wasted with misery, happy shall be the one who rewards you as you have done to us. The inference then is verse 9 is simply a repetition for our cry for justice. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. It's still hard. I don't recommend it. But it's there. And again, we can skip over it. We can pretend it's not there. Or we can seek to understand the depths of the pain of the psalmist who wrote it. And then... Uh, ask through the lens of Jesus, how should we respond? In kind or in kindness? And, and woe be it for me to judge a situation of millennia ago and say, oh, you got that wrong. Um, we're God's people too now, but we have the light of Christ and we have the Holy Spirit with us. And Jesus, again, he does not call down punishment on the world that is crucifying him. You and I, our sins, the sins of all of humanity in this world, are crucifying Jesus. And he does not say, let it be done to them as this is being done to me, by them. He says, Father, forgive them. He was on a mission to really die for us. And so it would be completely absurd for in the process of saving us to condemn us. And he doesn't do that, does he? He saves us. When we look at the Gospel of Luke today, we have Jesus giving a warning about how foolish humanity can be, particularly these people he's talking to in these crowds. He says, look, you can predict the weather relatively. You know, you can tell when it's going to be storms coming. You look west, you see the clouds coming. You go, it's going to rain, and sure enough. Or you feel where the wind is blowing. And in today's modern science, we have all types of forecasts and so forth. But here's the charge of hypocrisy. Remember, hypocrites are actors. They know one thing, they do something else. They, they have one reality, they present a different reality. So you hypocrites, he says to the crowds, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, the signs around you, but you will not or you do not know how to interpret the present times? What's he talking about there? He's the Messiah. He's there in their midst. And many reject him. He then gives us sayings and teachings and Again, uh, we, we have those teachings of Moses today, and it's very earthy again, and it gets sort of in the nitty-gritty of things. Again, but challenging. Here, though, notice it's a different tone of teaching, though. Jesus says, when you have uh, someone accusing you of something, and I think the inference here is that you've actually done something wrong. I could be misreading that, but that's the way I interpret it. Um, then, then try to settle. Make a settlement with the one who's accusing you. Because, it says, because Jesus says, look, if you don't, if you, if, you, if you drag this out in court and then the judge finds you guilty, you're going to go off to basically prison. And, and, and it's a debtor's prison is the inference from verse 59. And I tell you, you will not get out until you paid the last penny. Now let's spin that up a little bit and think of God's righteousness and our sins. The knowledge is before us, right? You and I are fallen. You and I are broken. You and I are the obstinate ones. You and I are sinners. 
Jesus comes to save us from our sins. How foolish to say to our only, the only Savior that we could actually have, we cannot save ourselves, how foolish of us to say to him, no, I've got this, thank you very much, or I don't need you, or you know what, I don't even believe in you, just leave me alone. You see, you and I can never pay the last penny. We can't pay any of our debt when we get right down to it. Only God, our Creator, only He can forgive our debt. And His Son does that for us and our benefit. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And then the challenge is, how dare us then treat other fellow human beings with contempt when we've been shown such mercy. And then there's the teaching from verse 13 that we, uh, chapter 13 here. He talks about, you know, us judging other people. Well, they deserve what they got. You know, they, inter they interfered with Pilate and, and you know, he, he killed them as they were attempting to um, offer sacrifices to God. Think about that a moment. They're doing the right thing. In, I am, I am reading into this. I could be wrong, but I'm looking at this, thinking, look, these people are doing the right thing. They're ac they're offering sacrifices to God, and yet Pilate, the Roman governor, the pagan, kills them. It's sort of like saying. You know, what about those people who were going to church and lightning struck the, the, the church and it burnt down with them inside? Or l let me take you back to something that actually happened. I, I want to say it was in Portugal centuries ago. But, and it was either Easter or Pentecost Sunday. The, all the churches back then were full and there was a tsunami. And everyone's in church and they're worshiping and the tsunami comes and literally wipes out the village. Now those people are in prayer. My goodness, they may have just said confession and they perished. And Jesus is saying, do you think they were worse than all the other people because they suffered this way? No. No. Or what about the, the folks where a tower falls on them and kills them all? Do you think that they deserved that somehow? They were worse offenders than others who lived in Jerusalem? And Jesus again says, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This temptation of all of us to practice relation, uh, relative uh, ethics, where what we do is we don't say, looking at the scriptures, because that's our guide, right? We look at the scriptures and we go, Oh, uh, yeah, that, that, the scriptures say don't do this and we're doing it. And that's wrong. Situational ethics are when we say, yeah, but look at them over there. They're doing it and, and nothing's happening to them. So maybe, uh, or, or we'll say it's just a little, it's a little white lie. Nothing, no harm, no foul. Or look, it's between the two of us. And whatever two uh, consenting adults agree to, then, then what, what is it of your concern? Well, I'm not, I'm not part of the law enforcement, uh, you know, I'm not part of the scribes and the Pharisees and those who actually get in the nitty-gritty of trying to force people into faith. But what Jesus is teaching, I think, here is the situational effort, uh, situational ethics, or at least I'm reading into that, is a very dangerous thing. The fate of every human being is to die. We are made of dust, and to dust we shall return. That's our, that's our statement that, that the priest says on Ash Wednesday as uh, the ashes are imposed on uh, the penitent uh, as a reminder and a preparation of entering into the Lenten season, the preparation of examination and confession uh, before one uh, goes to Easter and the celebration of the resurrection. It is not a time of putting away beer, alcohol, and cigarettes because, or fasting so that we can lose weight. It's about facing our death. And if the, it is, as we understand, the fate of all humans is to die. The next question is, what happens after death? We're studying that in Bible study on Sundays. 
now. What happens after death? Are we just obliterated? You know, that's what some of the atheists say. A person dies and they're buried and their $3.50 worth of chemicals just leach back into the ground and pff, that's it. Or is there more to life than this? Some religions say that, oh, there's reincarnation. If you've been good and karma is on your side because you've been good, you'll come back as something better than you were. Or if you botched it, you'll come back as a lesser creature to maybe learn your lesson and grovel a little bit and be recycled again. Uh, that's one way that some religions sort of look at it. Some say, well, you just become a drop in the ocean and you just become one of the being of life. And so you just, you were pulled out for a season and now you just go back in. Is there more to life than that? Judeo religion, that's the religion of the Old Testament to the Jews, has an expectation of something greater than that. And certainly Jesus being a rabbi, being the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, he builds on that, if you will. He fulfills that teaching of the Old Testament. And he says, I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. The third promise to Abraham fulfilled in the person of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, fully man, fully God, that through him all humanity will be blessed. How? Because they're offered more to life than extinction, or just going off into a sort of nether world, or back into the ocean, or being recycled in incarnation, or whatever. And so the teach he teaching here from Jesus is, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's a wake-up call. And then the parable of the of the of the barren tree is both an example of judgment look for three years now think of that three years what does that remind us of how long was jesus walking this earth as god incarnate three years look for three years i've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and i find none cut it down why should it occupy why should it use up the ground and then there's grace sir leave it alone i'll dig around it i'll fertilize it We'll, I'll tend to it. I'll, I will offer it grace and care and love and compassion. And if it bears fruit next year, wonderful. It's doing what a frig tree should do. But if not, then we cut it down. So I want you to see, there's never in the scriptures, to my recollection, a time where there's a teaching about judgment without also a teaching about grace. Think about that. You know, God tells us, he teaches us, that in all the challenges, even the challenge of impending death, there is a way through it to the other side. Remember what we say at the burial of a Christian. Life is not changed. Not, excuse me. Life is not ended, but changed. And here we are, on the Monday after Pentecost Day, you and I can be continually filled with the Holy Spirit to do what? To proclaim this good news of what God is doing through His Son and the Holy Spirit to create a new Israel, a new people. And, and, and no longer does it based on being a physical descendant of Abraham it's to be a spiritual child of God through Jesus, his son. What wonderful news. And my friends, the news otherwise is pretty bleak. Road rage in California where a toddler strapped in his um, booster seat going to preschool is shot and killed and dies because someone got mad at someone on the highway. Or the folks that are riding the cable car going up to a, an, a, an amusement park on the top of a mountain in Italy. 
and the car collapses and everyone perishes except a child who's in critical condition and may die or may live. It's still unknown. But everyone else has perished. Learn from the signs. And one of the best things is don't beat our breast going, woe is us. Although, if it leads to repentance, go for it. But actually start by being the instrument of Christ in, for those around you. And may I suggest, just call me crazy, but may I suggest one way of doing that is to just be kind. Be kind to others. Here's a challenge. If you're a Republican, be kind to the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, be kind to the Republicans. If you're of a different race than someone else, or religion, or educational, or whatever, even if the person is identical to you, be kind. And if someone notices it and says said anything to you about it, give credit to the Holy Spirit. Give credit to Jesus, your Savior. What he did on the cross for you and for me is the very definition of kindness. It's self-sacrificial love. You can't get any more compassionate than that. And yet we're called, follow me. With God's grace and with the Holy Spirit, we seek to follow pilgrimage, pilgrims on that way to the heavenly country. And you know what? The heavenly country is already here. The times are here. There's evidence of the, of the fallen, broken world inhabited and occupied by Satan. But my friends, look at that flower of grace that butterfly of hope. Heaven's breaking forth. Aslan is on the move. Jesus is here. Let's continue now with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us, and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, 
nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. O Lord, we entreat you mercifully to hear us and to grant that we, to whom you have given the desire to pray, may by your mighty aid be defended and comforted in all advers adversities. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, who divide, whose light divides the day from the night, and whose... And, and I've got to start that over. <clears throat> o God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, Drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone works great marvels, send down upon our clergy and the congregations committed to their charge the life-giving spirit of your grace. Shower us with the continual dew of your blessing and ignite in us a zealous love of your gospel. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time I invite your prayers, intercessions, petitions, thanksgivings. And I always invite you to, as you think about this concentric circle, starting with yourself and reaching out to the ends of the earth, to also especially remember the lost, those who have, do not know Jesus, and all they have or the religions that lead them away from salvation, or they have no religion, and that's their religion. And pray for those who have heard the good news of Jesus, but from the sins of others or from the skepticism of the age or whatever, have rejected their only means and our only means of salvation. Let us pray for the lost as we pray about all of the concerns that the Holy Spirit places on your heart and on your mind. Let us pray. Amen. Please join with me now as we thank God in what's called the general thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope 
of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, God willing, I look forward to moving into this new week with you with daily morning prayer. And in the meantime, before we join together on Tuesday for prayer tomorrow, I'm going to try something and I'm going to ask you to try something. Be kind. Be kind to every animal, to every creature and plant, to every human being. Be kind. God bless you.